Okay. Hello, I'm Duncan, Duncan Pepper, and I'm going to talk to you oops, about the relationship between beaver and salmon. So, to beaver or not to beaver is the salmon question. <clears throat> Why am I giving this talk? Well, I'm very passionate about both salmon and beaver, and uh, I've had some life experiences which have given me some unique insights into the topic. I grew up on a farm in Highland, Perthshire, and we kept lots of different species of animals in different densities, and we would see how that affected the land. It was run like a, a series of experimental plots. And I was guided in my observations of this by my dad, Simon, who was a great naturalist and um, observer of nature. He was also the head of WWF Scotland, just to name drop. <laughs> um, uh, he would take me for walks in places like Glenfishy here, and we talked a lot about land use and deer and, yeah, effects of animals on the ground. Um, there's since been a great recovery here. I recommend going to visit. I went on to study ecology at Aberdeen Uni and um, worked as an assistant fisheries biologist for the Argyle Fisheries Trust. Here we are electrofishing. This is Alan Kettle White, whose brain I have picked clean. Well, I'm sure there's something left in there, but um, I certainly asked him everything that I could think of concern, concerning um, salmonids while I worked with them. With this job, electrofishing, which we were doing here, you walk upstream in the river, zapping little localised zones and catching the fish and then the fish recover. You measure them and see how, what, what, how many there are of what species and then return them and they swim away fine. Um, but while doing this job, you build up a really good idea of um, what densities of fish you're going to find in each habitat type. So you can predict, um, and we would play games saying, oh, I think there's going to be four salmon par here and three trout and things like that. Alan was very good at it. Um, and yeah, it helps you to read the river over time. I also worked on these three water bodies and have fished them and guided as a fishing guide on them before there were beaver and since. Those water bodies are Loch Barn Lewiskin in Argyle and Loch Collibar in Argyle and the River Tay. And I've seen the positive difference since beaver have become established in terms of fish numbers. And with my wife, Maya, here, we run River Revivers, which is a river restoration service. Maya has taught me a lot about the geomorphology of rivers and what represents healthy balance when it comes to the river processes of erosion, transport and deposition, and how to identify unhealthy looking rivers in, that, in those senses. Um, what we do, we carry out habitat surveys and then we will plan restoration works and then carry out those works. And here's me uh, putting in a tree kicker to a river to try and pinch the stream to blow some uh, fine sediment off some spawning habitat. Um, a, a job, incidentally, that beaver will do for free. <laughs> um, and I did a course in soil biology um, and this might seem irrelevant but I know that it's very relevant and I get trotted out now and again to um, speak on documentaries or YouTube videos about about ecology or fish or beaver and this is from Riverwoods this one but I've also done them for um, the Beaver Trust produced one called Beavers Without Borders and I've I've done lots for Mossy Earth, who have got a big YouTube channel. 
Um, so here's how the talk is going to go. I'm going to talk about trees because they are the go-between in the relationship between salmon and beaver. I'm going to talk about the worries that anglers have when it comes to beaver and what the anglers are concerned about uh, when it comes to salmon, how beaver might affect salmon, and then the things that I believe we need in rivers. And then if this talk were a meal, then the main course would be the stream evolution model, which is a new way of understanding rivers and how they can evolve into a better state or evolve into a worse state over time. And then hopefully, well, we'll look briefly at studies from other countries and then hopefully you're um, thinking, what can I do to help? If so, we've got a section on that. Good, so this is very true. But before we do this, uh, I'm just going to tick this one off. Um, this, despite the caption which says black beaver biting fish, this is not a beaver, this is an otter. Beaver never eat fish. They are entirely herbivorous. They only eat plant matter aquatic and terrestrial plant matter. A common knee-jerk reaction when people come across this scene, which is a common scene wherever you've got beaver, is that this is a disaster, that the tree must have died and that beaver are guilty and bad and should all be shot as a result. However, all of our native broadleaves, with a couple of exceptions, will coppice, that means will grow again from the stump. No harm is done after all. In fact, the multi-stemmed regrowth that you get off a stump provides really good shade, which we'll look at later. And if coppicing is done with a sort of 10 year interval, then you can keep a maybe 10 to 20 year interval, you can keep a tree alive indefinitely. If you were to go on a course to learn how to coppice, to give the tree the best chance of survival, they teach you to make the cuts away from the center so that the water sheds off the stump, which is exactly what beaver do. They make these angled cuts that shed water, almost as though they understand that this is their food resource and they want to keep it alive, almost as though they've had tens of thousands of years of practicing. Oh yes, they have. Um, just to clarify what I mean by coppice, here's a tree, then you've got the stump, regrowth from the stump, and over the course of a few years, you can have more biomass on the stump than you had in the original tree. So that multi-stemmed growth that you get from coppice creates dappled shade. This image here in the top is pinched from a Forestry Commission, now known as FLS, video, um, which talks about the benefits of dappled shade um, for the forest floor. Well, you've got the same benefits in the river. Um, if you don't have dappled shade, you've just got blanket shade, then you might not have much plant growth below, as you can see from this lower image from the Burks of Aberfeldy, where it's July and everywhere else, vegetation is bursting up everywhere, but not here under this blanket shade. Uh, whereas under the dappled shade, you have plenty of growth. Both aquatic plants and terrestrial plants benefit from dappled shade, as do fish. If we imagine our salmon is Salmon are territorial and they might only have a meter or two of a square meter or two of territory in the par stage. Um, if they've got the options of light and dark within that small territory, then their their chances of survival are higher. Um, not all trees have the same ecological value. <clears throat> By ecological value, I mean how useful those trees are for all the other life and for what's known as ecosystem services. So 
I'm using uh, insects here as a proxy for ecological value, uh, which isn't the only ecological value that a tree provides, but insects, because they form the base of so many food pyramids on which, on top of which are stacked amphibians and fish and reptiles and birds and even small mammals, um, they are very important. So the top three trees on this table, oak, willow and birch, each have over 200 associated insect species. Whereas rhododendron at the bottom has zero insect, associated insect species. Um, the top half of the table is all native trees. The bottom half of the table is mostly introduced uh, species. There are a few caveats to this table. Um, no one individual tree is likely to host every one of the possible species that can associate with it. Um, and this table is made for the south of England, where beech ranks mid table with 64 associated insect species. Beech is native to the south of England. It's not strictly native to Scotland. And so there are far fewer associated insect species in Scotland and it would rank much lower. But this um, brings up a, an important point for the salmon um, beaver interactions. Those many, many years of co-evolution that the insects have had with our native tree species has allowed them opportunities, has allowed them to develop and evolve into making use of all the different niches that the different tree species can provide. Um, and diversity is not the same as biomass, another caveat. So you might have a holly tree which only has seven associated insect species, but if one or two of those species occur in abundance, then that could be an important food tree. Um, all those trees in green font will coppice directly off, this, off their stump, and here they are, pictures of them. Aspen, which is bottom left and up one, um, doesn't coppice directly off the stump, but it does a sort of underground coppicing, which is called suckering. It will throw up new growth there and new trees come or start to grow from the existing root system. And then birch, again, doesn't often get regrowth right on the stump, but it will send up basal shoots or epicormic shoots, which form new trees. So whereas the best species we have that provide the, the greatest benefits for other wildlife, those do coppice, with the exception here of Scots pine, which is a native tree, but I haven't included it here because it often grows on, it prefers drier ground. And so it's not often the subject of uh, beaver attention anyway. Um, whereas our, the best trees do coppice, some of the less desirable species do not, such as Sitka spruce, which is very commonly used in these largely lifeless blocks of dark green conifers you see all over the Scottish landscape. Um, those non-native trees don't provide nearly the same kind of benefits for wildlife that our native trees do. And fortunately, quite a few of them do not coppice. So Sitka spruce is also invasive and is taking over lots of new ground. When beaver come along and fell it, that creates an opportunity for a native much more ecologically beneficial tree to grow in its place. Where does this beaver weeding fail? So yes, we can con consider beaver as doing a, the job of weeding here, taking out the less valuable species, allowing space for the more desirable species. Um, well, it fails if you've got too many sheep or too many deer which have access to those stumps to eat the coppiced regrowth the coppicing regrowth, uh, or to eat the sapling which is growing in this place of the Sitka spruce, for example, or Norway spruce or Doug Douglas fir. Um, 
Also, some of the less desirable species, unfortunately, will also regrow. So here's a, a rhododendron, rhododendron ponticum, the least desirable of all the rhododendrons, um, which has been chewed through by a beaver, but unfortunately it's regrowing from below that chomp site. Are there scenarios in which beaver weeding fails? Well, or, or sorry, within which uh, beaver don't improve things ecologically. Yes, there are. So for example, if you've got just a single line of trees and no prospect of regeneration, in other words, new trees growing up because herbivore impacts are high, in other words, too many sheep or deer accessing the banks or livestock or deer, um, sooner or later in these scenarios, you're going to have no trees anyway, because when the old ones get so old that they die and fall in the river, and the river carries them away, then, yeah, you got no trees anyway. But beaver would speed up the process of not having trees on site. And although you get a brief ecological uplift for the few years, while if they ring bark a tree while that is decaying and the insects have colonized it and those insects sometimes fall in the water and provide food for fish. And also when they fell trees into the water, that structure um, helps with aggradation of sediments, helps with distribution of sediments and also um, provides a shelter space for fish and is colonized by insects, which are food for fish. Although you get that brief window, once you get once you've got a really big flood that takes the wood away, you're in a worse place than you were when you had trees on the bank. Um, however, is this a beaver problem or a sheep and deer problem? I would say, you know, we need to keep our livestock off the banks of rivers. A 20 meter buffer strip should be a minimum. Um, beaver, after all, if left to do their thing and given a bit of space, as you will see in this talk, bring a lot of life, whereas sheep and deer in high densities do the opposite. Sheep and deer in very, very low densities do help to bring life, but yeah, not in high densities. Now, in SEPA's binding rules, general binding rules, it does say that you're not supposed to have livestock on the banks of rivers. But when I tried to find this, it wasn't very hard to, it wasn't very easy to find. And the language wasn't very emphatic when I did find it. So it says to keep livestock feeding areas away from water courses and reduce poaching. Poaching is the effects of footfall on the bank, which mash it up, destabilize it, turn it into mud and create diffuse pollution. Um, and quite often cause banks to collapse as well. So that's what they're saying. And I would say that the only way to effectively reduce poaching is to not allow livestock access to the banks at all. Of course, they need access to water, but that water should be provided in troughs and we should keep them away from our rivers, which uh, can't deal with that sort of level of footfall. It's not just... Um, Livestock that are a problem for rivers, also arable farming can, and all there are many other types of pollutions like what we're taking as medicine and ends up in this, can end up, you know, being flushed down the toilet and sometimes that ends up in the river. Um, that's a problem as well. But uh, these buffer zones, you can see here on the left, a healthy riparian buffer. If we consider for a moment that those trees are, are releasing about 70% of their photosynthate, that's their sugars and carbohydrates, which are produced as part of photosynthesizing, they're releasing those into the soil to feed microorganisms in the soil. And that massively increases your microorganism uh, populations in the soil. Um, they do, trees do that because those microorganisms, fungi, bacteria, protozoa, nematodes, help them to grow quickly um, and provide them with lots of nutrients and minerals and more access to water. 
but they also, those microorganisms create really good soil structure. So that can, whatever land use is happening on the other side of the buffer zone, the buffer zone plays a very important role in cleaning up uh, any runoff that can come from it. Whereas if you've got, well, you can see in the image there, um, we're getting um, her uh, herbicides, pesticides, um, insecticides, oh, that's the same as pesticides, fungicides, and um, inorganic fertilizers coming into our rivers, all of which are having catastrophic effects on aquatic life, particularly insect life, but also lots of other things, including salmon, of course. <laughs> Um, so let's create these 20 metre wide buffer strips as a minimum and government needs to pay for farmers to create these, subsidise the farmers in not farming that land. OK, moving on to what the angling community's concerns are when it comes to beaver. Well, they are concerned about beaver dams interrupting fish passage, so fish migrate up and down the river, not just uh, during migrations, but also just to make take advantage of hatches of insects and food opportunities or shelter opportunities. They need to move up and down. They are worried about the untidy look. So um, many fishing beats, particularly salmon fishing beats, can look quite manicured, rather like um, the gardens of a country park, which might be appealing to the eye, but aren't much, aren't all that great for wildlife when compared to wilder areas. Um, but the chewings of beaver on tree, some people find quite unsightly. Although I would say in this picture, that's an ecological win because that's a beech tree casting blanket shade. Uh, so ring barking, it means it turns it into deadwood and creates an opportunity for a more desirable tree to grow in its place a properly native tree. And uh, anglers are worried about the changes that beaver make to the shape of a river, which they can do over time. And the last thing here is silt. So by burrowing into banks, beaver sometimes cause those banks to collapse and that can mean a release of silt. And silt can be a problem for salmon spawning sites. It can compact the gravel. So the salmon are find it very difficult to dig a nest, which is known as a red. Um, and also it can compromise, silt can compromise the amount of oxygen which flows through the gravel, which can increase mortality of eggs. So I'm afraid I'm going to subject you to some scientific papers. Um, that's where the data is. And although beaver dams might look impassable, the data suggests that they're not. Here's one with castor fiber, the beaver native to Scotland and Atlantic salmon, our native salmon species, which was conducted in Norway. Um, most of the studies concerning salmon beaver interactions are from the US <clears throat> because there are more salmon, more beavers, more scientists and more money in the US. So it's understandable that there are more, more papers on the topic that come from there. This one was done by Duncan Halley, who uh, is a Scot who now lives in Norway, and his colleague Mallison. And together they looked at how beaver dams influenced the movement of juvenile Atlantic salmon and trout on three beaver dammed and beaver free tributaries of important salmon rivers. They found that the greatest proportion of Atlantic salmon were upstream of beaver ponds. And if they're upstream of ponds, then they must have negotiated the dams, either the adults or the juveniles or both. They found that dams did not block the movement of juvenile salmonids, that they were mostly able to wriggle through and or their ability to use the upstream habitats, which they obviously prefer from the habitats which hadn't been affected by beaver. Um, the small scale of habitat alteration and the fact that fish were able to move past dams makes these two scientists feel that it's unlikely that there's any negative impact of dams on juvenile salmonid populations.
Okay. Now we're going to move to one of the many, uh, I'm only going to show you two American studies um, concerning Castor canadensis, which is the North American beaver, and two uh, Pacific salmon species, coho and steelhead. Steelhead are actually sea run rainbow trout. So they tested the ability of juveniles to cross man made beaver dams. Uh, they found that when they tagged and moved the fish downstream of the dams, they found them upstream of the dams again within 36 hours. They discovered that um, the, in, the, in the creation of dams, you also cre create uh, multiple flow paths. So the dams themselves are leaky and around the dams, you tend to get uh, channels forming as well. And these were beneficial for fish passage and upstream of the dams they found an abundance of juvenile salmon salmonids several orders of magnitude difference in favor of the number of juveniles using the pond habitat upstream of the dam so salmonid means trout or salmon and they were far far more using pond habitat upstream of the dam in some, their studies suggest that beaver dams, BDAs, and other channel spanning habitat features, which might be a tree falling into the river and then woody debris accumulating behind it, should be preserved and restored rather than removed because the obstru obstructions to fish passage were actually more perceived than real. The perception, it looks like uh, they're going to obstruct passage, but it appears that they don't. Um, some people throw out these American studies because of the. they'll say that there's su such a difference between the life strategy of an Atlantic salmon, which prefers fast flowing riffle habitat in its juvenile stages. That's very different to the Pacific species, which are very happy to live in beaver ponds, very slow moving water. Not so much the case with steelhead, which is why I've chosen examples that contain steelhead. I would say these fears are justified in streams that look like A here, where you have uh, a very concentrated flow in one area, high stream power. It's got embankments on either side. It's just one depth of water and one speed of flow, very limited habitat. Whereas if you've got streams that look like F, where you've got multiple channels and vegetated islands between those channels, temporary ponds, permanent ponds, all manner of speeds of flow and depths. You've got deep pools where those channels come together and make plunge pools. You've got something for everything. Uh, that means you're providing living space and food for, for plenty of salmon in that scenario as well as lots of other life. Here is the Bridge Creek study. Uh, this is Bridge Creek back in 2005. Um, there were, there's a small population of steelhead remaining, clinging on in this very incised river. Um, it had at this time the same number as its control stream, which is nearby. Um, and some people suggested a plan. They they um, they were proposing to put in a hundred BDAs, which are beaver dam analogs, to try to help this stream, um, and to try to bring back the steelhead populations. There was quite a bit of infighting between um, fish scientists, some of whom believed that. There's such limited spawning habitat here and putting in the beaver dams might jeopardize that, might um, cover them up. Uh, they, they were worried that it wouldn't work. However, they ran it anyway and it's been going now. Well, I think they started building dams in 2006 and here's the difference. So they built over a hundred uh, BDAs, channel spanning, beaver dam analogs, which is a human built imitation of a beaver dam. 
And whereas the stream was incised, it's now lifted um, the river to connect it to its floodplain. Uh, the adults, uh, beaver came and colonized this site and added a further hundred dams uh, to, to the stream. So the adult um, steelhead who are returning are crossing 200 beaver dams to get up to their spawning sites. And the juveniles are passing down past 200 dams. This river is now <clears throat> three times more productive in terms of steelhead numbers than the control site, which is a very similar river, similar how, to how Bridge Creek was at the start. <clears throat> Over 100,000 steelhead have been tagged and there's a 52% better survival rate in this stream when controlled when compared to the control site. Uh, one of the papers um, written about Bridge Creek, this is the conclusion of it, and it says, following the installation of beaver dam analogues, we just observed significant increases in the density, survival and production of juvenile steelhead without impacting on upstream and downstream migrations. The steelhead response occurred as the quantity and complexity of their habitat increased. So quantity and complexity. Those were the key factors which made, which increased the population of steelhead. So let's just look at a wee example of quantity and complexity being played out over the years after a beaver have come into a site. So I've pinched these images from a talk given by Mark Elliott to the Devon Wildlife Trust. And it, his talk was about the River Otter Beaver Trial in Devon, in England. And um, when I first saw this image, I didn't really know what I was looking at, but that dotted line, a gray dotted line that goes through the middle. And that's, a, that's the stream course, a very, small stream, one too small for salmon really to spawn in at this point. Salmon tend to start to dominate rivers that are over three meters wide. Below three meters wide, that's really, trout tend to dominate in those scenarios. You do get salmon and stuff that's smaller than that, but this was a very small stream. Okay, here's what it looked like in 2012 after they had built a few dams. And here we go through the years. As you can see, the quantity and complexity of habitat is rapidly increasing. And now you've got a stream that could support salmon spawning. Um, okay, so the last, this is the last paper and it's a meta-analysis where um, a group of scientists looked at all the the data to date, all the scientific papers concerning salmon beaver interactions. They reviewed the whole lot and then they did an expert opinion survey. This was carried out in 2011. Um, the research is regionally biased towards North America, as we've explained before, there's reasons for that. Um, the benefits to fish were cited more frequently than the costs. There were 184 benefits, and they were majority evidence-based. So there was data, scientific data, backing up those benefits as, as being uh, demonstrable. Of the 119 costs, 70% of them were speculative. So things like, oh, it looks like fish couldn't get through that dam, but turns out they probably can. Um, and then the surveyed these 49 North American and European experts and the majority of them agreed that beaver have an overall positive impact on fish populations. The most frequently cited benefits of beaver dams were increased habitat heterogeneity. So that really means quality and complexity. We go from homogenous here at the top down to heterogeneous here at the bottom. Homogeneous is samey, one speed of flow, one depth. Heterogeneous is differenty, as I like to call it. Could also be called varied or habitat mosaic, structural complexity or quantity and 
complexity of habitat as was mentioned before. So it's not hard to imagine how there's going to be an awful lot more life in this image in the bottom than there is in this image in the top. All of that dead wood, all of those trees have insects on them. Many of those find their way into the water and become food for fish. Another threat from having rivers that are incised and embanked and straightened is this not just limited habitat, but also that they function as a fire hose. So you're concentrating the flow, you, you're, you're upping the stream power, which makes the river more erosive as well. Um, if you imagine you, you've got your uh, garden hose in your hand and you start to put your thumb over the end of it, you know how that concentrates the flow? Well, you get the same thing here with these incised channels and the embankment. You, you concentrate the flow so much that it can become, uh, well, it's good for washing your car. And that means it's also good for um, stripping off material, substrate from the bed, which is why they become increasingly incised quite often. And, and over time, they host less and less and less life, as well as being a perilous place for a salmon to live, because during those high flows, they're just going to get washed downstream. There's, there's no structure for them to hide behind. And so you're losing that possible recruitment potential that you could and could have in these upstream waters. They're not recruiting fish, so you're not producing lots of young salmon, which then have to do their sea run. Um, so you're reducing your output potential in terms of fish. Whereas in the scene below, You've taken away the stream power, so there's very little chance of those fish being blown downstream in a high flow event. You've, you've effectively slit open your garden hose or your fire hose and allowed it to spill over a big area. And that has created lots of different habitat types. And of course, within all those different habitat types, you will have different insects make, taking advantage of it, which means hatches at different times. You'll have stoneflies, mayflies, caddisfly, all which are the main food source for juvenile salmonids, um, all hatching at different times, and you will be support, supporting more of them. And that means, of course, more food plus more shelter. You're going to have far more fish coming out of a scene like the one below. OK, just to reiterate this one last time, there we've got within the yellow box in the top image, you've got a concentrated flow, high stream power per unit width, known as the fire hose effect. In the bottom image, you've got that flow is distributed throughout a roughened surface, which interrupts it, slows it down, forces it to make that habitat complexity, to push around a piece of dead wood and create a new pool or scour under it and creates a more adult habitat. Um, create a meander around, yeah. Okay, so let's move on to aesthetics, the way we like things to look. Many uh, anglers and beat owners like the look of the, uh, the top image. I also like that. I'd quite like to fish that. It looks fun. However, I know that all the river that we have that looks like that isn't going to operate at capacity for fish production. Um, also, a lot of the bankside trees have been felled, maybe to make it easier for casting. Um, and that means less, obviously, insects falling in and whatnot. All the studies show, and the electrofishing experience I have certainly shows that where you've got structure like the bottom image, that's where you're maximizing salmon production. Um, you don't need all the rivers to look like this bottom one, but we must bear in mind that whenever it looks like the top one, we're not doing all that we can for salmon recruitment. Here is an image of probably the most uh, productive salmon river in the world. Doesn't have Atlantic salmon, actually. Uh, it's got lots of Pacific species, plus lots of colossal trout in it. It's called the River Tugur. It's in Russia. But um, what you can see here is consistent with what you will see in the most productive Atlantic salmon rivers in the world, which is lots of trees, a wiggly course, and quite often 
braided or multi-channels, also known as anastomosing when it's got um, vegetated islands between those channels. And beaver can help to create scenes like this by creating dams and felling trees. They push the river into a new channel, which may be temporary or permanent, but all that complexity starts to build over time. And beaver really accelerate that. In Scotland, we've got some quite good shape here. This is some quite nice meanders and some quite good spawning habitat. But this is a pretty hostile place for salmon to live, especially with what's predicted in terms of climate change. It's shallow, it's not got any cover, not got any shade, not got any quality in stream cover. Um, fish here are going to get hot and although there might be some good spawning sites, there's not going to be very many insects here. So little, not much shelter, not much insects, very susceptible to the heat stresses and very susceptible to predation because of that lack of quality cover. Getting trees on this landscape in order to save salmon is absolutely essential and we need those buffer strips too. Um, <clears throat> if it looked like this, that would be an awful lot better. I know that's a much bigger river, but we do have some examples in Scotland which are starting to look a little bit like this. Okay, if you do want to protect the trees on your banks, and I would say it's a very good idea to do so, especially if you have native broad leaves that are getting over 60 years old or over 80 years old, particularly oak, you definitely want to protect those from beaver because those are very valuable trees. If you've got lots of regen coming up below them, lots of wee trees coming up to replace them, it doesn't matter so much that you might lose some of the older ones, but especially in places where you've got no prospect of that, you definitely want to protect the older trees. And you can do that simply on your own by wrapping it with this. If you would rather not do it on your own, then you can send an email to beavers at nature.scot and they will send someone out to wrap your trees for free, no charge. And they might send me to do this. I'd be very happy to. I probably wouldn't wrap the beach as someone has done in this second image here, or I would if that's what the landowner wanted, but I would tell them that beach aren't the best tree for bank side uh, for the bank side it would be better to have a native broadleaf grow in its place but yeah. okay uh, moving on to silt the fears around silt so salmon need uh, clean gravel within which to spawn they're looking for uh, golf ball to orange size bits of gravel to spawn in and Silt can cause a problem with compaction and with oxygenation of salmon reds. And where beaver dig into banks, that can cause the banks to collapse and there can be a, an input of silt into the river. So first question, do we have good structure? If we have good structure, then that silt isn't a problem. It gets deposited downstream of, of things like that woody structure that you can see in the river there it actually gets graded. So the finest sediment gets deposited against the bank and the coarser material as the flow speed increases going towards the middle. And this can help to make what was a straightened channel meander a bit more. And it's the start of the recovery process actually. However, if you've got no structure, then you might get that silt um, spreading itself evenly on the stream floor, stream bed, which is not ideal. Next question, is there good morphology? If there's good morphology, and this is what good morphology looks like, or one of also behind me is very good morphology, um, then those finer sediments will be deposited on the inside of the bend where the flow is slowest. And these type, this, this, this image here, is an image of torturous meanders, which are among the best spawning habitat that we have because of the varieties of flow. Uh, there's always somewhere which, you know, the, the sediments are well organized by the river, maintaining good spawning sites. Okay, 
Next question, do you have multiple channels? Like you see behind me, if you have multiple channels, then there's always somewhere for that silt to go, um, which it's not gonna cause a problem. If there's just one channel, then it's quite possible that it could be evenly spread. How do beaver help us get out of this? Well, you can see here, um, they will put structures into the river. If there's no trees around, they can do this with stones and turf. And they will build a sort of Toblerone shape with stones and then add turf to that and start to build structures that way. Um, and that will force the flow to start to meander, to start to wiggle. Um, and th in this way, they can take an incised stream, which is cutting into its course and bring it back up to the surface where it's connected to its floodplain and brings all these benefits to other life and particularly to salmon um, and make it multi-channeled. So you then have good morphology, good structure and um, and multiple channels. Okay, so here's our stream, which conceivably is susceptible to an even spread of sediments building up on the stream bed. And along come beaver and build dams and fell some trees in. And then sediments start to aggrade, that is build up, they aggrade behind the dams. And you'll notice that downstream of the dams, there's no sediment because now we're keeping that fine sediment in a very localized site. Um, and every particle of sediment that's trapped upstream isn't choking a uh, salmon red downstream. And over time, it aggrades more and more and that stream bed builds up and then eventually you get these side channels forming. And now the fish um, have much easier access to upstream habitats and, and complex habitats. So let's look at that from a different angle. We have beaver come along and build a leaky dam and sediments aggrade behind that dam and that pushes the water level up. And then over time that can become the stream bed. And then again, they come along and build a dam. Again, the sediments aggrade and then that's pushed the water up higher. And over time, that can create new channels forming, help to create new channels forming. Okay, you might be looking at that scene and thinking, I don't want that water on my land. I want to get it off as quickly as possible. Let's just imagine a 10 meter wide stream and we allow that stream to flood 100 meters on either side, only to the depth of one meter. And we should be very grateful to any farmers who are willing to allow their land to flood because they do us all a great service in terms of reducing what we pay in home insurance, um, reducing the costs to government when there are uh, detrimental flood events which um, call, flood lots of homes and cause lots of damage and, and upset a lot of people. Um, we should be very grateful to them. It's, if if you wanted to carry that same amount of water in a, in that channel, you would need to dig it 22 metres deep, which of course is unfeasible. It would collapse if it were only 10 metres wide and 22 metres deep. Um, but let's just, for the, this example, say that it is possible. Well, that would be passing the flood problem on downstream with the sort of fire hose effect. So for those areas that are allowed to flood, we have that storage of flood water instead of passing it on. And that means there's a delay in the flood wave, which might mean that the flood doesn't breach the um, flood defences downstream. There's a massive reduction to the stream power in the channel. And there's an, there's an increase in temporary habitat, which might be used by wading birds or um, amphibians or even fish. Um, beaver dams are effective silt traps. Let's just knock through it once more. You've got the dam, you get the aggradation of sediment, 
Then you get new channels forming and those new channels bring new spawning substrate downstream. So the downstream spawning area is bigger in size than it was before. And fish can also spawn in the channels themselves. Then you've got the connection to the floodplain. You've got the improved hyperreic connection. So the hyperreic zone is like the river underneath the river. And when you've got hyperreic exchange, which happens when you build up the weight of water behind a dam and it filters down through the river, through the gravel and into the hyperreic zone and then comes up again out of that hyperreic zone downstream, the water's now cooler and it's much cleaned because it's gone through a gravel filter. A gravel filter is what I use in my house for all my drinking water that comes off a stream. It's very effective at knocking out all the undesirables or an awful lot of them. So you've got a far healthier river, um, much more complex habitat as well. You've got improved climate resilience. So both during floods, which we've talked about, and during droughts. So you've increased that water table. You've made the surrounding land absorb a lot more. You've got that hyperreic zone connected, plus the aquifer is now topped up. All of that water can gradually um, seep out into the river during times of drought and keep fish alive. Some of the tributaries of the River Tay run completely dry during droughts. But if we were to have more beaver dams or beaver dam analogues in the, the headwaters, that could hold water in the river for much longer. And that, of course, means more life. So yes, you can see here how the weight of water above the dam helps to push the water down into the hyperreic. And when it comes up again, that has a reduction in the stream temperature because it's gone into that cool underground zone and it's cleaned as well. You've also got my, more riparian vegetation and more habitat complexity. So less of this, please, <clears throat> and more of this. Again, you've got rich um, soil here, which is providing that very valuable buffer zone. All those trees are hosting insects, which during a breeze, some of which end up in the river and are food for fish. The trees are being gnawed by beaver and falling into the river and um, creating shelter for fish as well as food and so on. It's not hard to believe or to understand why there's an awful lot more life going to be supported in this scene compared to this scene. Life of all kinds. We need that biological uplift, the biological drivers which drive us towards um, the sort of nirvana state, the healthiest and most productive in terms of salmon and other life, the, the forms of river that are the most productive in terms of other life. You need biology to push us up. No amount of good hydrology and geology can do it alone. We did see in the Scottish example quite good hydrology and geology, but no biological drivers, so a pretty impoverished system. Biological drivers are things like beaver dams, log jams, vegetation, and the local biodiversity, which includes the salmon themselves swimming upstream with marine nutrients, which are then spread throughout the landscape and increase the vegetative growth. And the more vegetation, the more insects, the more insects, the more fish and other things. Okay, I think we've got that now. So, a bad scenario is exposed soil because you're losing a lot of your nutrients and your topsoil into the river. Uh, the best scenario is vegetated banks. But in the middle there, you've got this woody debris on top of soil. That's dead wood has helped to start uh, in this little experiment, um, build up a a fungal community in that soil. And that fungal community, because it's a, a branching tubular network, starts to create a sort of filter. So you'll notice that that water's a bit cleaner. 
Deadwood is dead good. And Scotland has got only 10% of the European average of deadwood. In other words, we're missing 90% of our deadwood. Deadwood gets colonised by all sorts of bugs and beasties and insects, many of which end up falling in the river and becoming food for fish. Deadwood means at some point it's probably going to end up in the river <clears throat> as well. And when it does that, it becomes high quality structure, excellent structure. The best kind of structure is uh, root wads and crowns of trees. OK, beaver are experts at creating deadwood. Here's an image from Tony Donnelly, who's no longer with us, sadly. Um, he was the head of the, the head biologist at the Annan Fisheries Trust. Um, and during that time, he uh, was monitoring for uh, par density relative to in-stream cover. So when he says excellent in-stream cover, he means root wads and crowns of trees. Good in-stream cover is woody debris of other kinds. No in-stream cover is obviously just, you know, not even boulders. Um, so he was finding 20 salmon par per 100 meters squared where there was excellent cover and none where there was, uh, sorry, and three or four maybe where there was no cover. A pretty big difference over the same area. Just bear that in mind for recruitment of salmon. Not just for juveniles as well, the adult fish like it too. These are sea trout crammed in under a bit of woody structure in the river. Here on the River Tugur, you can see there's lots of woody structure um, there on the outside of the bend. And the fine sediments have been deposited on the inside of the bend. So, yeah. Um, how do fungi play a role in this? Well, they play a pretty big role. And my t-shirt is um, kind of a testament to that. Fungi have two main jobs. One is decomposing organic matter and turning that organic matter from a state where plants aren't able to absorb it to a state where plants are able to absorb it and therefore that increases plant productivity. And their other job is the mycorrhizal network. So you might think of fungi as uh, mushrooms, but mushrooms are just the fruiting bodies of the fungi, the sexual organs of the fungi. Fungi spend most of their lives as branching fusing tubular networks which reach throughout the soil and they increase the reach of plant roots and bring um, nutrients, minerals and water to the plants and both of those jobs help massively increase plant productivity and where you've got more plant growth you've got more insects, more insects means more fish of course. Let's have a look at it. So how do you get more fungi? More beaver. Beaver will create standing deadwood, which uh, is colonized by bugs and beasties, some of which fall into the river, which become food for fish. Beaver will fell trees onto the bank, which becomes food for fungi and then increases the fungal population. And then you have increased uh, vegetative growth, including trees. Those trees produce leaf litter. Leaf litter is what gets um, aquatic invertebrates through the lean months of winter. And aquatic invertebrates are the primary food source of juvenile salmon. Also from those trees, you've got insects falling in all the time, terrestrial insects, and those are food for fish, for salmon. Um, beaver will also fell trees into the river and those trees are very rapidly colonized, particularly by caddis flies, which love um, woody structure in a river. <clears throat> and those caddis are food for our juvenile salmon, so upping the population. Also, that wood that's been felled into the river becomes a great shelter place for, for salmon during high flow events and from predators, meaning higher population, less mortality. <laughs> And probably the most important role of all is the role that deadwood 
structure or woody structure plays in the stream evolution model. So to go from a degraded state of stream to a productive, a biologically productive state, you need some structure to force that change. And the best sort of structure for that is woody structure. So they make silt traps, they grade the sediment, there's shade for fish, there's scour, positive erosion, there's water table increase, there's mitigation against flood and drought, peaks and troughs, so many benefits. And here it is, the stream evolution model. Up at the top there, you've got what it, you've got stage zero. And stage zero, what it looks like on the ground is multiple channels with vegetated islands. Um, and in the image B on the right, you've got the pie charts. So the bigger the pie chart, the more benefits there are for more life forms. So the, basically the more life it can support. Um, and you'll see that stage zero has um, the biggest pie charts of all. And stage three, four, three and four have the smallest. Um, so stage four is supporting very little life. Okay, I know I've not given you time to look at all of this, but we're going to look at it a few more times, so don't worry. Um, so this is how it gets better if you put it in a linear way going from uh, degraded to approaching optimal. What we see behind me in this image is laterally, mm, it's moving into stage eight, I'd say. It was laterally active and now it's anastomosing. Yes, it's stage eight. Uh, and you're starting to get vegetated islands and you've got multiple channels. And this is this is Glen Feshi, and one action occurred here, which was a massive reduction in deer numbers down to about one per square kilometer. And as a result, you've got heaps of tree growth and the river has really started to recover. In time, I'm sure this will be a real powerhouse for salmon production for the spay catchment. Okay, <clears throat> um, it's very similar to succession in plants, which is why I want to show this slide now. And I think succession in plants is much easier to conceptualize. So we're going from exposed rocks, which host a little life, but very little, over the years, improving and improving snowballing effect of more life. And that happens because of an input of uh, organic material. So those exposed rocks eventually get colonized by lichens and mosses. And when they die, their organic material starts to form a poor soil on which weeds can grow and their dead bodies form more organic matter, which makes more food for fungi and bacteria and the other microorganisms in the soil. And then you start to get richer and richer soil until at the end you've got what we call a climax community, which is in lots of Scotland, an oak dominant forest. That doesn't mean just oak, it's oak and rowan and hazel and alder and willow and aspen and many other species. Plus, hopefully, lots of deadwood and maybe the odd exposed rock and other things as well. Um, and you can see how the fungal biomass increases alongside um, this succession in plants. Succession and evolution are pretty much the same thing. So here we have evolution in the river and here we have succession in plants, same thing. More life at the end. Okay, so how can it get worse? Well, it gets worse when we take a braided channel or a, a sinuous channel and we canalize it. In other words, we straighten it. And there was an awful lot of this done in the UK, particularly during the Edwardian and Victorian eras. And uh, we're paying the price today in terms of water quality and habitat complexity and wildlife. <clears throat> so big circle means positive attributes and benefits. 
lots of ecosystem services and lots of life. Small circle means impoverished river. Beaver can move it from impoverished to healthy. And there we are. All of these are really the same thing um, and can be summed up by those big pie charts. This is the sort of nirvana state for rivers. This is rivers performing at their best. This isn't suitable for every reach on a river. Um, tends to be on depositional sites. If you've got a confined valley over bedrock, this can't happen, or it's very unlikely to happen unless you have a massive landslide. Um, you do need to have movable sediments in order to create the habitat complexity. Okay, have we got any in Scotland? Well, we've got this bit of the River Feshi, as I've already mentioned, which is approaching stage eight and getting better, and it's gonna be hosting lots of life and its future is very bright. And we've got a tiny wee bit on the River Tay near where I am, where there's some wetland there in the bottom left. There's multiple channels. Beaver have been on that site for um, uh, over 10 years now, and they have helped to form some of the new channels by felling trees, which has created a new flow path. They also dig channels sometimes. Um, and you can see there's still plenty of trees there. So these myths about, you know, if you get high density of beavers, which doesn't really happen because they're highly territorial and they keep um, a certain number of, you know, one family will control a site which might be a mile or two of river and they will fight to the death with other intruders. So you don't tend to get high density. What we want is spread so that they can occupy as much of the suitable habitat as possible. But yeah, this area is has had beaver for a long time. Two families close with um, lodges either end of this site. So this site gets quite a lot of attention from the beaver. So here's there's the river Tugur again, so productive that, oh, and here's the Ponoy. Um, this is probably the most productive Atlantic salmon river in the world, or it'll be one of the most productive, if not the most. Again, it's got a wiggly course, lots of trees. And if we zoom in on those wiggles there, we see this sort of thing. Um, lots of trees, wiggly course, multiple channels. Again, multiple channels, wiggly course. This is the Tugur once again. And the Tugur is so productive in terms of salmon that it has a species of trout that eat adult salmon. This is a, a Taiman here and they get over a hundred pounds. There's another one again from the Tugur, and the Tugur produces the biggest salmonids on the planet. Um, these are productive salmon rivers in Norway, the Gaula, and the, I think that's the Orkla. Um, again, wiggly, multiple channels, lots of wood. Wiggly, multiple channels, lots of wood. Okay, I think you get the point. How else can beaver help salmon? Well, they can knock out some of the chemicals that might be in the water. So a study by Exeter Uni showed that after dams were built and trapped a lot of sediment, that reduced the phosphate load by 20% and the nitrate load by 30%. Um, and during 2001 floods in Russia, three beaver dams trapped 4,250 tonnes of solids. And you can imagine what that river looks like now, pretty well spread out. And we also find when the dams blow away, um, you get exposed new spawning sites and it has raised the riverbed level. Here are images of water taken from above the dam and then below the dam, and you can see the suspended sediment differences in them. Much cleaner water below the dam. Okay, a little bit of evidence from Norway. All these spawning sites in the middle of the screen, 22, 21, 20, all of those, the beaver, the salmon that are using those sites, and they are using those sites, have passed 
multiple beaver dams to get there, almost 20 beaver dams to get there. Um, none of the Norwegian scientists are worried about the effects of beaver on salmon. Um, despite having had beaver for a lot longer and having more salmon than us, and uh, they've got a lot more money to spend on it and more people working in that realm as well, they're not worried. These images are taken from Duncan Halley's talk that he gave to SWBG, the Scottish Wild Beaver Group, a few years ago. So what can you do? Well, first of all, you can change the language, help to change the language that's used. Um, we often hear people saying abandoned or messy, neglected, unkempt, untidy, but here are some more suitable words, I think. This scene is not in need of a good chainsawing. It's just fine as it is. It's getting along nicely. Habitat is increasing. And uh, that is not beaver sign. Uh, sorry, that is beaver sign. It's not beaver damage. Beaver sign. Here's some of the stuff that we do. We will do similar things to what beaver do, creating tree kickers, which are have various uh, objectives, helping to grade sediment and helping to uh, pinch the flow to blow fine sediments off uh, spawning sites. And when we're doing things like green revetment days, um, that's a great time to have volunteers. So if you would like to come and help us, we would be very grateful to receive you. You can help us bash posts in or bring brash to the site. That'd be great. Um, or you can come along when we're planting. We make these seed islands. There's 60 trees in this little square. And until we get on top of our deer densities, this is a way of establishing trees. The idea being that deer don't like to jump into a small space. And so you don't have to make them deer height. It's a bit of an experiment. So far, they're working well. Here are some that are well established on the D and you can see trees are growing inside them. Um, yeah, come along and help, please. If you'd like to learn more about this stuff, you can find out more about it here. And if you'd like to get in top contact with us, go to riverrevivers.co.uk and uh, you can go onto our contact page, contact us and write us a message and we'll pick that up. Or you could write direct to mayapepper at gmail.com and Maya will thank you and then add you to our list of volunteers. One last thing I just had to squeeze in was this image of where we've had a wildfire and <clears throat> um, everything in the surrounding area has been burnt except where beaver have created dams, raised the water table, and that was enough to stave off the blaze and the trees have survived. This could be extremely valuable in the years to come to be a seed source for that surrounding area and Scotland is looking at increasing temperatures and increasing risk of wildfires as well. So we get improved floodplain connection, more deadwood, in-stream woody input, dappled shade, silt trap, climate resilience, a reduction in drought, flood and drought risks, improved water filtration, improved sediment grading, and that weeding process we talked about where beaver take out the bad trees and get good trees in their place or better trees, less good trees and better trees. <laughs> okay, beaver do all that and that helps salmon. And then, oh, yeah. When uh, considering beaver impacts, we need to consider those holes that they dig and the sediments that are released. We need to consider the dams that they create and how that sometimes floods farmland and costs farmers money or the state cost the state money in some cases uh, we need to consider all those things when weighing up whether we should have beaver or not but we, on the other side of the scale we put all these guilds of life as well as all the benefits I've already mentioned 
And for me, that tips the balance pretty heavily in one direction. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I hope I have inspired you to increase your love of beaver. Thank you.